we've all seen the work of sculptors, great sculptors like Michelangelo, who sculpts fine pieces in marble and granite and uses fine tools to come up with the kind of details that make them masterpieces. We've heard of Rodin's The Thinker using the same kind of tools. But have you ever realized that there are some artists, some carvers, some sculptors who use chainsaws? We're at the Butler Farm Show grounds just outside of Butler, and we're here for the Butler County Chainsaw Carving Invitational. And actually, it is an international event because shortly after this meeting this weekend, many of them are going to Germany for an international competition. Ken Tynan is from Butler. He's been carving with chainsaws for about 13 years, and he's one of the people that helped bring this whole operation here together. He worked with the Butler County Tourism Bureau to do this. Now, Ken, it's amazing to me, having looked at some of the works behind us and being worked on right now, that a chainsaw can produce such beautiful works of art. Let's talk about you first. How did you get involved with it? Well, I started about 13 years ago uh, when I was a billboard painter, and I knew that was going to come to an end eventually because of printers. And I thought I wanted to stay in art somehow, and I knew I wanted to sculpt in some fashion. And I happened to run into some chainsaw carvers uh, in that period. I actually started hand carving, taking some wood carving classes, and uh, quickly picked up the chainsaw because I wanted to carve big like I painted big. So uh, that's how I really got started. Well, now, when you're doing uh, carvings, you use little tools, little chisels, and, you, and, you, and, and special tools to get the fine detail. How in the world can you do that with a big chainsaw? Well, like chisels, we have different size chainsaws. So we'll start with our bigger blades, four or five, six footers, to knock off the big chunks. And our saws will go down uh, as the wood goes down. So we get down to what's called a dime tip. Uh, on our bars that will cut on the size of a dime, and that's where we'll get our final detail, putting fur in, eyeballs, noses, you know, the fine detail. Ken, when you see a big tree trunk, do you know exactly what it's going to look like when you're finished? Well, usually I come in with an idea. So I, if I have a customer or something they want to, for instance, uh, as soon as I get back from Germany, I have to carve a, a likeness of Arnold Palmer at Stoughton Acres Golf Course. So I know what I, what I have, now I have to look for a log that maybe will fit my design. But when you get a log, sometimes when you get inside, there are going to be knots and imperfections. How do you get around that? You, you have to pray. <laughs> so usually you can tell, if looking at the perimeter of the log, where those knots are going to be. And sometimes, just because we've done it so long, we see a certain lump somewhere, we say, I know there's a pocket of rot there. So we'll either turn the log, or, or if it's a stationary tree, we'll just have to you know, start from another angle and work through it. Sometimes you'll even have to repair that spot. You might have to knock it out, make a block, glue it in there. Nobody will see. Out here at the farm show grounds for this invitational this weekend, there are lots of carvers. We can hear them buzzing in the background. Are these a special group of people? You know, I was so lucky that at, for the timing of this event, being on Mother's Day weekend, is the week before the World Cup in Germany. It's called the, the Husky Cup. And we got nine of the carvers, the, all the Americans that are going to the, the Husky Cup agreed to come here first because some of them are from Oregon, California, Mississippi. We all thought we'd just fly out together out of Pittsburgh on Monday. So we're kind of acting as, uh, as if this was a, just a warm-up for the Husky Cup. So these are world champions and some of the top contenders in the world? world we have uh, Bob King, who's a world champion, who also carves for Disney, also carves for George Lucas on his private ski resort. Uh, we have Jason Emmons, who's uh, on the TV show Saw Dogs. Uh, we have also Jeff Samadowski, another world champion who's here. Ken Packy, a world champion, is here. And actually, we have Denny Beach, who maybe people don't know, uh, carves at the Butler Fair every year. has been going there, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 years. He's a world champion. He's also going to Germany to defend his championship this year. When you, uh, w when you do this carving, is this what you do for a living, or do you have a, a part-time job as well, or a full-time job where you just squeeze this in on weekend? Uh, no. You know, when I got into this, I went full in. You know, I... At the time, I was married. <laughs> My wife had a good job. And, 
you know, but now it's, you know, I rely on myself. I have, this is all I do. What's the most impressive piece that you've done over the years? Uh, you know, one of the pieces I'm most proud of is uh, I carved Mother Teresa, a bust of Mother Teresa for uh, um, Father Jim up at St. Andrews on Route 8. And uh, I, worked, I, I worked in that thing for weeks. And uh, at the end, I, didn't, I wasn't quite sure it looked like her. I thought, is this a flop, you know, that when he got it, it was, you know, he, he made sure that I knew that it was exactly what he wanted. All right, you start with the tree and you start carving and you get the image that you want. Sometimes do you paint uh, over that or do you color it somehow? At times, if people want some color, I don't generally paint on my carvings because I either paint, which I'm a painter, or I carve. So I don't like to mix the two for some reason. I don't know why. But I will burn them. And we'll take torches and we'll burn adding uh, shadow lines or, you know, especially on uh, wildlife. Uh, they take on that burnt color anyway, most animals, you know, bears and things. If you burn them, it looks real natural. Now, there are some carvers right behind us, and they are buzzing away, and some of the pieces already, just in this first half hour of 45 minutes, are starting to take shape. When they're done here, what do they do with the pieces that they've made at this competition? Well, we have a co we have a auction on Saturday uh, starting at 5 o'clock. Uh, while that's going on, though, while the auction's going on, there'll still be people here carving because they're going to get ready for the next day's auction on Sunday at 3 o'clock. And we're going to auction off everything that's here. And that way, uh, the deals that people are getting in Butler County with this beautiful artwork from these people, because what it comes down to is not only do we have these world champions here, but we have carvers that could be world champions that just haven't entered yet. They're terrific. I really got the best of the best. What are some of the really good-looking pieces sell for? It all depends on the market. <laughs> if a lot of people come to the auction, we just need two people that want one thing. <laughs> so they could go. A lot of times you'll see pieces going for a couple thousand dollars uh, down to $50 for some things, you know, because there'll be little things you can walk out with. And Speaking of little things, I understand there's somebody out here who carves on, of all things, toothpicks. Ragnar Reusch Klinkenberg from Germany. I wish she was here right now. Uh, she's back there carving, of course. But she carves on the heads of toothpicks the most fantastic things you've seen. Uh, she gave my mother what looked like a little eaten apple core, which you can only see through a magnifying glass. Uh, she carves people, ballerinas, clowns. She'll, do, she'll carve a balloon on a string that looks invisible as you, with your naked eye until you look at it with a magnifying glass and see that string holding the balloon up. So this is a craft that people really take seriously, and I'm just wondering, we're going to take a look through some of these places as we do this program and talk to some of the folks out here. Well, let's talk a little bit about Germany that's coming up. Now, that's next week, and how intensive is that competition? Uh, you know what? It's, it's, it's torturous, actually. We get the, it's great. I mean, we are pushed to our limit right now. What's, we're lucky to be carving with each other as friends, you know, buddies, we can comment on each, other, on each other's piece. But when we get to Germany, we're in it for ourselves. We have to carve, we have to actually tell the other person how bad they're looking. <laughs> you know, come down and, you know, make a little criticism, <laughs> it might spook them. But it's, uh, but it's still wonderful, we get to hang out with my friends in Germany. You know, at the end of the night, it's Germany, so they're tipping a few beers, you know, <laughs> by the fire. So we, it's, it's, it's a wonderful and it's an honor to be asked to go to Germany. Ken, what's the prize for the winner in Germany? Uh, I think it's 4,000 euro. So it's not really for that much money, as it, but they pay for everything. They pay for your trip over there. You need to bring no equipment. It's all waiting for you. It's, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you've, you're catered to. Ken, this is exciting. We're going to be talking to some more people out here at the Butler Farm Show grounds for this uh, Butler Invitational chainsaw carving program and it's exciting to talk to you and thanks for having us out. I thank you Larry, it's been my honor. We had mentioned earlier world champions here at this special invitational at the farm show grounds. Well Bob King is one of those world champions. He's from out on the west coast and uh, he's done some remarkable carving pieces which we'll show you and also work with some very famous people. 
Bob, uh, you've been doing this for a long time. You weren't always a wood carver by trade. What did you do before this? No, I wasn't. But, you know, my prior job, my prior career was with Boeing, the Boeing company. Um, I was an aircraft inspector, non-destructive inspection specialist was my, my job. So we basically looked for uh, defects within the aircraft, structural, uh, whatnot, just tracked them, make sure it was still flyable. <laughs> Bob, what, what took you in the transition from an aircraft inspector into a chainsaw carver? Well, you know, that was, I remember that day. It was at a local fair in Puyallup, Washington. Uh, my family and I were just enjoying the fair as most of us do. But like you'll see out here, I was on the other side of the fence watching a local artist. And I, I became really enthralled with what he was doing, you know, and I thought, gosh, that looks really cool. And I kind of wanted to buy one of the little bears that they had. And my wife says, you're not buying that. Make your own. <laughs> hmm. Make my own. So I, I don't know if it was a challenge, but I thought, oh, maybe I could do that. It doesn't look that hard. Did you start with regular carving with little tools and chisels, or did you start on chainsaw right away? No, I went straight away to the saw. Maybe it's a guy thing. I just, you know, I don't have the patience for the little carving tools and whatnot. I have huge respect for the folks that do hand carving now because that really requires a lot of determination and, and skill and, and patience. But for me, the instant gratification of the chainsaw was so attractive that and you'll see that here, how remarkably quickly we can produce really nice pieces of work. So I, that was it for me, and I went right to the saw and just took right into it really quickly. Well, don't you have to have some artistic talents? When you were in school as a kid, did you draw a lot? Did you make carvings out of soap or anything along those lines? No, I really didn't. Um, you know, the typical classes that were required in school, you know, making little plaster of Paris things and whatnot, uh, art classes that were you had to have mandatory that's it and for me I can't draw I can't paint I can sculpt anything with a saw it's a, a god-given gift really um, I think we spoke a little earlier it's a spatial perception as I think the common connection that we have as artists chainsaw artists here just being able to uh, hold things in your mind in 3d and rotate them and and produce that in a solid mass of wood. Our nature of art is reductive. It's reductive in nature to say. So it's all takeaway. You can't put it back, not easily. So you really got to be on your game. You remember the first one when you, when you decided after seeing that bear that you wanted to buy and you decided to get into a chainsaw carving what your first piece looked like? My first piece, yeah, that was, I, I, I tried to, a little bear sitting on his butt holding a little honey pot, and that was to be a flower pot, you know. I thought, well, that's, at least it's useful art, it's functional. Um, and so I went home and I gave that a shot, and you know, after three days, it took three days to make it, and uh, after three days, stood back and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, it, it looks like a bear. <laughs> that's a bonus, and, and you know, it, it was everything I had hoped it to be. The same thing takes maybe an hour now, but that's the beauty of it. There's always growth. Isn't it amazing that the first one you tried turned out to be as good as you say it was? You know, I, yeah, I, I still look back at pictures of it. Someone wanted it more than I did, and they, they lifted it out of my front yard. But <laughs> maybe that's the ultimate compliment. Someone's possibly willing to go to jail for your art. But I was really happy with what I had. And, and you know, I look at images now, and I think, oh, I, I'd like to fix that. But that's the that's the beauty of it, to look back at the progression from where you started and where you're at now. And I hope that one day I'll look at back at the work that I do currently and feel the same way. I think, oh, you know, I was really still green then. Always room for improvement. You're a world champion. How did that happen? <laughs> I've been blessed with lots of success. Thank you. And that's, uh, that's through a lot of marketing with my wife. We, I travel a lot and get your name out there work really hard and just the, the love of the art form really drives that and so you you just through the, the wonders of the internet you can keep in touch with people all over the world that that produce these kinds of shows internationally um, get your foot in the door and once you're in and you, you you're honest and you create nice product man you can go places you really can now you're going to Germany next week for the international competition. Do you have something in mind that you're going to be carving? Yes, in fact, the theme there is the Zodiac. So each of us 
artist has a zodiac sign that we have to produce in wood. Mine is my birth month, which is Virgo. Um, so that's going to be pretty exciting. I have Virgo to create, and I, I'm really stoked. Do you know exactly what it's going to look like when you're finished, or is that a work in progress always? It's always something in progress. I have a basic concept in my head. Again, I can't draw, so I, I glean different thoughts and whatnot uh, from the Internet or, or books and whatnot for form and flow and all these fancy words that we use, you know, the, the composition, so that it's appealing and it, and it, and it looks good and, and, it, and it looks like something that I would be really proud to own at the end of the day. So, yeah, we're just working on that right now. You've worked with some very famous people. You've done some work for George Lucas, I understand. You've done some work for the Disney Company. Tell us about that. Yes, I have. That's really been a fun couple of projects in the last couple of years. Burton Snowboards, that's uh, the main connection there. I've worked for them for seven years now, do a lot of projects with them. But anyway, uh, a collaborative effort with Disney as well as Lucas Films. We did some Star Wars characters and the Disney uh, uh, Toy Story characters. That was fun. It's for snow park, snowboarding parks for youngsters to learn how to snowboard. Um, stand sideways, riding sideways on snowboards instead of the sticks, the, the skis. So much fun. Did you ever work directly with individually with Mr. Lucas or any <laughs> Disney people? No, I think he was on uh, lunch that day. He just, <laughs> just didn't, didn't show up. All right, well... When you're, when you're selling a piece like that, uh, how do you price it? Now, when, when you're at a place like this, you can only charge so much, I suppose, to the general public. Well, when you get to work for Lucas and you get to work for Disney, uh, maybe the sky's the limit, or is it? Now, I'm a very reasonable artist. I use that term loosely. <laughs> uh, I, I, I price my articles just to be fair. I don't need to be rich. I don't need to make a lot of money. I really don't. I love what I do. If they appreciate what I make for them, um, I'm going to keep those jobs by keeping my prices good for me, good for them. They get a nice product. I get the connection. You know, everybody wins all across the board. That's the way we do it. Now, Bob, when you uh, do a piece and it turns out to be particularly wonderful, maybe something that you're really proud of, is it difficult for you to, to sell that, to let it get away from you? No. Uh, if I decide to make a piece, maybe for my wife or a family member or a close friend, that's the way it starts and that's the way it ends. Um, I have no connection with anything else. I'll always have a photograph or the experience. But I, I got into this to make money and that's what I do. I, I love everything I make. I put my heart and soul into everything I do. and. Uh, it goes wherever it goes. Now, there's one piece you were talking with me about earlier, about a, a, a horse, a, a life-size carving that looks like it, it should be in marble. Tell us about that. That was a fun piece we did in Germany last year. Two fellow teammates from America, Chris Foltz and Scott Dow. Uh, we went over there. It was a team effort. We made uh, a Saxon king, King Otto. He's from the, I think, the late or mid-1800s at any rate. He needed to be sitting on a Frisian horse, a war horse, and uh, we used three giant uh, German oak logs, joined them together, and through all of our different skills, collaboratively, we put them all together, converged, and in five days we produced an outrageous sculpture that, oh my goodness, is really something to be proud of. If anybody ever gets a chance to view it, it's something that, uh, it's, I, I'm not much of a flag waver, but I'm really proud of us for doing what we did. Where is that being displayed now? That's in Mulda, Germany, at uh, a place that's called Blockhausen. That's a German term for log home or log structure. It's a huge, huge uh, resort type structure in the hills of southern Germany. Bob, it sounds exciting. It's fascinating how you got into it and what the results are and the kind of work that you're doing. Good to see you here in Butler. Thanks very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Bill Shout from Cranberry has done work here at the Farm Show grounds during the Farm Show. And as a local chainsaw artist, why, he's done some pretty interesting things. What are you carving out here today? Uh, we're actually helping put on the show, uh, me and a couple other local carvers. Uh, so I'm in charge of the logs and, and moving the logs around here. And then I display my carvings on Route 19 in Cranberry Township. 
uh, on a regular basis, and we carve locally here at different events. What are some of the subjects you carve? Uh, a lot of bears, of course. Everybody likes bears, right? Um, definitely eagles. Uh, do a lot of human faces uh, with spirit type faces, that type of thing. Isn't that really difficult to get the intricate uh, lines uh, in a person's eyes face? Eyes are a challenge, folks. Eyes are definitely a challenge. It's all about the eyes and the nose and the face. How do, you do the how do you do that with a big chainsaw to get that detail? Well, we actually have some smaller chainsaws to help out with that. And, it, and we do a series of die grinders. Um, two different size die grinders. Basically, there's a bigger type of die grinder and a, and a very small like Dremel type of die grinder for the very intricate work. When you do your work here at the farm show uh, during the summer, uh, does the public buy everything you make? Uh, they buy a good quality of what we make. Um, we also raffle things off for different charities, uh, Evan City Fire Department, our local fire department. Uh, last year we did some fundraising for the farm show themselves. So um, it all works out very well that way. You're in the excavating business. How do you get from there to chainsaw carving? Hey, it all started with a woman. That's all I can say. I, I had a lady friend who was, liked chainsaw carvings, right? And um, we bought them. And then I'm like, hey, this is getting expensive. And um, so I started carving at home. And, and actually, my first little bear that I made took me 19 hours to make a bear about 18 inches tall, and uh, which now would take me about an hour at the most to make the same bear after five years of chainsaw carving. What work have you done that you're most proud of? Um, probably our benches. We make some really nice relief carvings. Um, I've done some elk, uh, white tailed deer. Uh, those are probably my, my favorites. And not too many people relief carve anymore. There was a guy, uh, Benazet Way, um, near Ridgeway, and he had passed away a couple years ago. And, and I had a lot of pictures of his work, and I kind of learned from him. His name was Bob Huff, and uh, I do a lot of pretty nice relief, which is something different that these guys don't do as much of. Where do you get the trees, the wood? Um, I talk to every tree guy that comes through town. So they all know my name and they all have my business card. And I say, hey, you know, call Bill Shaw whenever you get some nice white pine, you know. Bill, have there ever been any projects that you started that just didn't work out and you couldn't finish it? No, there's never a wrong carving. They just get smaller or a change of plan, you know, a change of plan or whatever. But really, unless the wood's really terrible, I, uh, I, we can make, make something work. You know, really, we can. That usually works out. Bill, it's good to talk to you. Thanks very much. All right. Appreciate, appreciate everybody coming out here, too. Thank you. We've heard of um, chainsaw work, large pieces of, of wood being carved, sculptures, but with chainsaws. But there is a person here at this invitational here at the Farm Show Grounds in Butler who does something on a much smaller scale. She is Ragna Reusch Klinkenberg from Germany. Ragna, you do something that's amazing. You carve on a toothpick? Yes, I carve from toothpicks. They are very small. How did you get the idea, after looking at all the work being done behind us on huge logs and huge trees, how did you come upon the toothpick as your, as your medium? I carve since I'm seven years old and uh, not on toothpicks, but on small things, on small pieces of wood with a pocket knife. And one time, some years ago, I did not find any wood, but in my pocket I had some toothpicks. <laughs> Maybe used, I don't know. <laughs> were you artistically inclined when you were a child? Did you draw or do anything along these lines? Yes, I drew a lot and uh, I carved. <laughs> oh, I did not start with very uh, complicated, complex things. I just started with mushrooms and owls and then I tried to do a frog and so on. So. Now, you can hardly see them because they're so small. When you started carving on toothpicks, what did you do with the finished product? I sew them. There were people that were interested in buying these special toothpicks? I did. I, uh, first, I had the idea to carve uh, from uh, cloth pins. <laughs> and I was on uh, markets, on, uh, we say handcraft markets in Germany, uh, and I sold them. And so I just put some, some uh, of those toothpicks <laughs> on the table, and they wanted to have it. I don't know why. <laughs> As far as you know, does anybody else carve on toothpicks? I don't know. I don't think so. I, that was my idea, but maybe there are some more. I don't know. <laughs> How do you pick the subject? How do you decide what subject to carve? Oh, they, I have more ideas than I can carve. So <laughs> I just take some examples from the nature of 
Figures, I like figures, doing figures. If I asked you to carve uh, on a toothpick my face, could you do that? No, I should use a little bigger wood, but but I can't do it that. I can do it on a on the lead of a pencil. Now, wh what kind of figures will you be doing this weekend here in Butler? Oh, I started an angel, a flying angel, and I think I will do a chair with pink flamingos and, f and a frog, maybe. When you take a piece of wood, you find a log, and you decide what you want to carve in that log. Sometimes the wood is not going to be all perfect. There'll be knots in the wood or flaws in the wood. How do you work around that? Oh, sometimes I take them as they are, and sometimes it's possible to cut them off. You're from Germany, uh, and you're, are you going back there for the uh, international competition next week? No, not this time, no. Do you live in Germany, or do you live here? No, I live in Germany. I'm just here for one week for this event. Have you ever done an event like this before? Um, no, not like this. This is a very specific thing, I think. These guys, which are here, are really good. Did you ever have a real job? Yes, I'm a graphic designer ah. with a diploma, yes. And you work for what kind of a company? Just for a small uh, advertising. What part of Germany are you from? We come from the very north of Germany, of the western part between Bremen and Hamburg. So, Is, uh, is, um, uh, is wood carving highly acceptable there? Do people in your part of Germany um, buy most of the works that are brought to that area? Yes, I think it comes more and more. They, uh, chainsaw carving is quite new there. So, It's an interesting new art form. It's new to me, uh, and I'm sure to many people in this area, that never dreamed that people could take a chainsaw and make such beautiful pieces. <laughs> yes, it's so wonderful fast, the, the first hours, and then you have a lot of hours uh, to fix it. An amazing experience here in Butler County at the Farm Show Grounds, the Butler County Chainsaw Carving uh, Invitational, where 32 artists from around the world and around the country are here demonstrating their craft. I'm Larry Berg. We'll see you next time on Faces and Places. Mm -hmm.